7.30. All right, well, good evening to everybody. Um, uh, it's good. It's always good to see, uh, see you and to be together. I've, I've uh, enjoyed our time together on Wednesday nights and uh, I'm believing uh, the Lord will bless us again as we've come together around uh, his word as we continue to make our way through the, through the scripture. Um, let me go ahead and open us up in prayer and then I'll talk a little bit about what I want to try to accomplish tonight. All right, let's look to the Lord together. Uh, gracious God, we do uh, just uh, thank you, uh, as always, for uh, bringing us together on this night of Bible study. Uh, we're grateful for your word. Um, we're thankful that you allow us to uh, share in it and to, um, and to learn from it. We pray that uh, as we gather that you'll continue to speak into our lives and help us to uh, be better uh, disciples and to be better prepared and equipped um, to navigate uh, this world. And so we give you thanks for uh, just uh, collecting us together again tonight. Pray that you'll bless our time, uh, that your spirit will be present uh, even as we propose to, um, to make it through your word. So we give you thanks for tonight. Ask your blessings on it in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I do not have a long agenda today. Uh, I have uh, two things really that I want to, uh, I think I want to try to accomplish. Um, and so let me go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to open up this. All right, I only have, uh, okay, two, two slides. So what I want to do, uh, the agenda today is I want to talk a little bit about uh, a few Bible study tools. I was asked last week when I, um, when I uh, shared the, the map last week, if I had some recommendations as it relates to um, uh, a good mapping tool to use. Uh, and, uh, and I do, I, I have a good, I have a couple of recommendations as it relates to the kinds of tools that I think will enrich your study. Uh, and so I want to talk a little bit about Bible study tools. And then I want to talk today about the reading that we had for this week, which is Genesis, essentially the second half of Genesis. We dealt with the first half. Of, I'm sorry, that should be Exodus. The first half of Exodus last week, we're on the second half of Exodus this week. And I want to talk a little bit through that um, and then certainly open the floor for any questions, comments, thoughts uh, that you've had for the, from the reading for this week. All right. Uh, and so we're talking about Bible study tools. I'm going to unshare this uh, as I prepare to share a little bit. All right. So I'm not sure how uh, big I am on your screen. I'm going to actually show you a couple of things. So you may want to change your, your screen, to remove some of the boxes if they allow you to have a bigger picture of me. Um, but one of the things I want us to always remember is that, um, you know, as we're talking about Bible study, um, the only primary source, and when I say primary source, I mean the the, the only inspired, um, author, very author, all an authoritative source that we have is the Bible itself, right? So every single Bible study that we propose to do ought to always begin with the Bible. Anything else that we use to supplement is, is, is just that. It's a supplement or a support. I think one of the mistakes that I think sometimes we make when we Put your view and speak of, oh, okay. I think one of the things that we, we do sometimes, uh, which is a mistake as we come to Bible study, is we don't start with the Bible itself. We begin by reading somebody else's words about the Bible. Uh, and then what we really get is a simply an opinion. We don't, uh, everything else should just uh, inform our opinion about the word itself. Uh, and so let me, let me kind of start there. Um, um, for a second, I want to pull up one more um, piece here. We talk, talk about the uh, Bible. Let me exit out of this. Let me stop the share. Let's see if I can get this pulled up. I think this is it. Bear with me a second. I'm not seeing what I want to see. Yeah, this is it. 
Last week, last week when we were talking, one of the things that we talked about was Bible translations. We talked a lot about that. And so we talked about there being a variety of different versions of the scripture uh, and that each version of the scripture um, is valuable for the particular reason that you are going to it. So, for example, we said that if you're looking for a literal word by word translation, you might use um, a translation like the New King James, you might use uh, the New American Standard Version, you might use the English Standard Version. But if you're looking for something that's easier to read, something that has common uh, parlance and that uses today's language, you might use something like the New International Version. Or uh, if you're looking for something that's just a paraphrase, you might use the message translation or something other like uh, other than that. One of the things that I make a habit of doing when I'm really um, doing deep Bible study is I, I will use multiple versions of the Bible to compare how they um, how they render a text, right? Um, I, I think using multiple versions of the scripture can help um, to understand the passage a little bit deep differently, right? And so, and so when I say talk, when I talk about using the Bible itself as your primary source, um, one of the ways that you can do that is by using different versions. And I'll give you an example. Um, so these are the different versions of the scripture that you see on the left-hand side here. And if you look on the one, two, three, four, the fifth column, what you will see is the way that that particular version of the Bible translates 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. I want to read a couple different ways in which that verse is translated so you can get a sense and the passage a little differently. I read that passage from New, the New King James Version. This is how it's rendered. It says, we, however, will not boast beyond measure but within the limits of the sphere which God appoints, appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you, all right? So, you know, we read that and, and we get from it what we get from it. It might be a little bit challenging to understand exactly what Paul is saying there. Uh, if we read it from the New International Version, uh, this is the way it says it. It says, we, however, will not boast beyond proper limits, but will confine our boasting to the field God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you, all right? So that's the common parlance. If I read it in the message version, it says this, we aren't making outrageous claims here. We're sticking to the limits of what God has set for us, but there can be no question that those limits reach to and include you. Right, so you see the same verse is translated differently. It helps us to understand the text a little bit better. And then finally, if I was to read it from God's, um, uh, if I was to read it from the CEV, right? Contemporary English version, right? So this is gonna be a version that's really designed to help us to understand it in our common vernacular, right? The CEV um, translates it this way. We won't brag about something we don't have a right to brag about. We will only brag about the work that God has sent us to do, and you are part of that work, right? So it, so it just, it's a, it's a, a very different way of, uh, of, of understanding the text. It's the same text. Some of it is translated word for word. Some of it is translated uh, thought for thought. But by reading different versions, it gives us a rounded out version. One of the things that I think that's interesting about this particular chart is it shows us that the different versions of the Bible are written for a different reading level, right? So the reading, these are the grade levels, right? So if you're reading the Amplified version, it's, it's to an 11th grade, uh, essentially 11th grade uh, understanding. The, the CEV is a fifth grade version. The God's word is, is, a, is a fourth grade version. The King James is, you, you know, this thing, you need to really be a high school graduate to be able to really even pull this thing apart, right? And so, and so the different versions definitely have um, um, kind of a different, I don't want to say a different audience, but they, they resonate differently depending on what the purpose of that particular version is. 
Uh, and so I and so I encourage you as you are doing your Bible study, find a couple different versions that you like, um, and 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 check those passages against one another and see uh, and see how they may resonate with you at any given moment. All right, all right. So let me let me kind of introduce a couple different um, tools here. Um, and so once you have the Bible, once you have um, once you have re read it, once you have reread it, uh, and you've gotten an understanding, a little bit of an understanding about the text, there are a couple different tools here. Um, the first one I will share is a Bible, it's a Bible dictionary. Now this Bible dictionary, uh, and I'm wondering if the letters are backwards uh, as you're reading it, uh, but the, this is Unger's, U-N-G-E-R apostrophe S, Younger's Bible Dictionary. Unger's Bible Dictionary is probably the most well-known of the Bible dictionaries. You can probably get this in paperback. You can probably get this in paperback for, I don't know, eight or nine dollars, something like that. Um, and the reason why Unger's Bible Dictionary is helpful or any Bible dictionary is because as you are doing word studies, if you see a word in the scriptures that you want a good definition for, don't go to Webster's dictionary, go to a Bible dictionary. Webster is gonna give you a kind of a secular um, uh, definition of a word, whereas a Bible dictionary is gonna give you a theological, uh, a theological definition. If you look up God in Webster, you're going to get a very kind of vanilla, um, secular definition of God. If you look up God in here, it's going to give you scriptures that are going to be uh, referenced with the def definition, and it's going to give you um, a definition of God as it is in the Bible, right? Um, and so, and, and we all know that the definition of words is important. Uh, and so if you mess around with the wrong source and you get a bad definition, it can completely change your understanding of any given word. So Unger's is a good Bible dictionary, but there are others as well um, that you can that you can that you can look. But a good Bible dictionary is something good to have. I would I would also say to you that all of the resources that I I'm going to show you are resources that are available electronically. Uh, I'm going to show you a lot of books today that I haven't probably opened in uh, years because I have them all. Uh, on, on my computer. Uh, and so I, I have them all accessible there. All right. All right. So the second piece is a good uh, Bible atlas. All right. This particular atlas is the Baker at Atlas. Baker is just a publishing house, um, but there are all kinds of great atlases. Uh, and the great thing about a Bible atlas or an atlas, an atlas that is um, specifically about Christian history, is that the atlas will give you different maps as they relate to different times in the Bible, right? So uh, you can go to any atlas, and the atlas today will give you the geography as it exists today. If you go to an atlas like this one, what it's going to give you is it's going to give you like an atlas of Palestine. It will give you an atlas of Israel. It will it will trace the Exodus. It will trace the footsteps of Jesus. It will trace the missionary journeys of Paul. It will uh, it will give you um, it will give you maps that are related to the stories and the times that we find in the Bible. All right. Uh, so a, a good atlas is is always helpful. And I and I said to you last week that the reason why an atlas is great is because it puts before you spatially the things that you read in the scripture, right? So in, for example, in the gospels, we read about Jesus ministering all over um, Galilee. Well, Galilee um, or Galilee in, in Judea, in uh, what is modern, modern day Israel. And when you remember that Jesus doesn't have a car, he's not riding on like animals. He's, he's making a lot of these journeys by foot. It, it will help you to understand um, the distances that he has he has traveled. Right um, when you see, uh, for example, Jesus giving the instructions to the early disciples in Acts to be his witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, the outermost parts of the world, that that command will be, will take on a different resonance if you can actually see where Jerusalem is, where Judea is 
where Samaria is, and then where the outermost parts of the world would be. Uh, and so a good atlas will, will help with that. All right. The third resource uh, I might recommend to you is a concordance. All right. This is Strong's Concordance. Uh, Strong's Concordance is probably the best selling concordance uh, that's on the market now. But again, there are others, right? So a what a concordance does is it will list for you every single place in the Bible that you find a particular word, right? So if I open up this book, this book and I uh, and I look up the word law, like it, it reads like a dictionary. So everything is in alphabetical order. If I look up law, it will give me the word law in bold letters. And then underneath the word law, it will give me every single place in the Bible, chapter and verse, book, chapter and verse, where the word law exists, right? And so this is good because it helps you, like, so for example, if I was, um, if I was doing a study in the Bible about the blood of Jesus or the importance of the of blood in the scripture i might look up the word blood in the concordance and find everywhere in the bible where that word appears and see if those verses relate to each other see if those verses tell me anything more about the topic or the word that i am looking for all right now one of the things to understand about a, a concordance is that the concordance is going to be keyed to a particular version of the bible all right. So, for example, this this version, this this concordance is keyed to the New King James Version. Right. So it's going to give me everywhere in the New King James Version where a particular Bible word is. If you are a NIV reading reader, you need a concordance that is keyed to the NIV. Right. Or else it's going to take you to verses that that are not relevant to the to the to the, the, to the uh, translation that you have. So, so the important thing to remember about the concordance is it needs to be keyed to the particular version that you're working with. All right. Another another um, uh, tool that I like is something like this. This is this book is called a book on manners and customs. All right. One of the thing one of the challenges if you if you are uh, if you are, if you ever taken the, the the course or the study that we often teach at Clifton Park called uh, "Living by the Book," then you know that interpreting the Scripture is a process. Uh, you don't just read the Scripture and apply it directly to where we are today, because we recognize that the Bible was written to a particular people at a particular time, and so the the first step in in doing good. Bible study is, is understanding what is going on in the Bible in context, right? Uh, and so, uh, and so you, you can't take a verse. What's a good example? Um, if I, um, um, what's a good example of this? Uh, um, uh, a good example doesn't come to my mind right now, but but if you if you are reading the Bible in the in the and you're reading a particular text and you say, hey, this text I can lift it directly from the Bible and I can apply it to today's today, the chances are you're going to get a, a bad interpretation because you need to say what does this verse mean for the people to whom it was written, and then from there you say, okay, this is what it meant to them. Now, how do I determine what it means for me? And so a book like manners and customs will help you to understand how did people live then, right? Like it'll tell you things like, you know, you read in the scriptures a lot, stuff like, um, uh, you know, God said, take 50 shekels worth of linen and make the tabernacle with it. Or the widow gave all she had, which was uh, a, a two mites, right? And, and a, my, a manners and customs will tell you, well, how much is a mite worth today? How much does a shekel weigh today, right? It'll tell you how people lived. Were they farmers? Were they, um, you know, was it agrarian? Was it agrarian culture? Uh, how did families live together? So what was what was the role of, of, of men in the community? What was the role of wives in a house? Uh, what was slave, what did slavery uh, mean uh, back then, right? Um, and so, uh, and so that's a good one, right? So, so when Paul says that slaves need to obey their masters, uh, if we take that and apply it 
today, then we say, yeah, well, God will approve slavery because uh, he said slaves uh, obey their masters. But if you understand that when that passage was written, slavery was very different than the slavery that we understand today, right? It, it wasn't uh, a, a, a situation where it was chattel slavery. Uh, very often it was somebody indentured to somebody else who literally turned themselves over in order to pay off a debt. And when that debt was paid, the slave was released, right? If we understand that is the matter of custom, then it helps us to understand Paul's writing um, uh, better, right? So we're understanding the times in which they are written, all right? So those are some those are some general tools, all right? Let me let me give you a couple more, all right? So those 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 tools are designed to help you to formulate your own opinions about what the scriptures say. It is important as a Bible interpreter, as somebody who reads the Bible, as a disciple of Jesus, that you formulate your own opinions about what the scriptures say for yourself, right? We are not called as believers to essentially just um, be people who adopt somebody else's opinion and then go out into the world and regurgitate it for other people. We are called to be a people of conviction, who have done the, the work ourselves, right? And those types of tools that I just showed you will help you to formulate your own thoughts. But here's the thing. Um, there are thousands of years of people who have done a lot of work in interpreting the scripture. And so as you are coming up with your own thoughts and convictions, it is right for you to compare those to what scholars and people who have studied have said, right? You should not, you and I should not be coming up with uh, different theories about the Bible that no one else has come up with in thousands of years. If you are saying something that no one else in the church has ever said, you are wrong, right? If I get up and preach something that no other preacher in the history of Christianity has preached, I, uh, I, I'm not right, right? So one of the things that I do after I have come to my own conclusions and study um, as, as I check it against other people who have written on the subject, right? And so, and so when we're looking for other people's opinions about the scripture, what we're going to is what's called commentaries. These commentaries are essentially somebody else's opinion about what the word says. All right. So there are, these commentaries come in different shapes and sizes. All right. So what I'm showing this, this somebody said to hold it back further. This is called Matthew's Henry, Matthew Henry's commentary on the whole Bible. Um, th this is a, this is a, as far as commentaries go, this is kind of like an elementary school commentary. This is going to give you like, um, this is going to give you like the real basics that pretty much anybody can understand. It's not super deep. It's, uh, it's really kind of general. You can get Matthew Henry's really cheap. You can get this. You can get Matthew Henry's, probably, you probably get this book at this point for probably like five, six, seven dollars. All right. Uh, and what's great about Matthew Henry is that Matthew Henry is on the whole Bible. If you buy this volume, you're going to get every single book of the Bible in one book, Genesis through Revelation, right? You're going to get it all in here. And it's, and, and, and it's, not, it's not going to be super deep, right? Because the book looks big and it's good size, but it's not a lot when you're talking about a commentary on the entire Bible, right? Um, and so there are, there are several kind of one volume commentaries where you can get it all in one book. Uh, Matthew Henry's is a is a popular one. All right. When you move up from when you move up from Matthew Henry, uh, you're going to get two volume commentaries. Right. This is the Bible Knowledge Commentary. I think the Bible Knowledge Commentary is another pretty good commentary set that is uh, relatively inexpensive. Uh, and it gives you some very general understanding of, um, of the text. Now, it's multi-volume because there are two. there is an Old Testament volume and a New Testament volume, right? So if you're going to buy this, you need to get them together, um, or, unless you're just interested in the Old Testament or interested in the New Testament. Um, and so I want to give you an example of how commentaries work. Uh, I was asked a question last week. I think maybe Linda asked me the question about 
why God was going to kill Moses when he was on the way back um, to uh, Egypt, right? You remember the story, uh, Zephora um, circumcises their son, and, uh, and then God uh, allows Moses to live. I want to read you what this commentary series says about that passage. Um, all right, so the passage is, is Exodus chapter 4, verses 24 to 26, and this is what it says. It says, the circumcision of Moses' son, either Gorshom or Eleazar, seemed strange. In his years in Midian, Moses had neglected to obey God's command to circumcise one or both of his sons. So God was about to kill Moses, perhaps by causing him to be gravely ill. Zephora reluctantly circumcised her son with flint, and then God healed his prophet. Her touching Moses' feet with her son's foreskin was possibly a symbolic act of substitution in which obedience was seen as replacing disobedience. Zephora called Moses a bridegroom of, of blood. The meaning of this phrase is unknown, but some say it was used as a derogatory way to suggest that she did not favor the ritual of circumcision. Others proposed that she saw in the act a sort of redemption by which the blood of the youngsters, the youngster restored Moses to the Lord and also to her as a new bridegroom. All right. So that's that's essentially an example of what you find in commentaries. Right. So in a commentary, if you have a question about a particular passage, you can look it up in the commentary and the commentary will give you somebody else's. Okay, we'll give it a minute. I'm sure, he'll be back on. Thank you. In a in a commentary, then you've got the two commentaries set, and then when you move up from there, you get multi you know really multi volume commentaries. So this commentary series is one that is is really probably too too deep for um, a, the regular kind of ordinary lay person. But this is my favorite commentary series. It's the New International Commentary on the Old Testament, Testament and the New, Interna New International Commentary on the New Testament. Um, all right, I froze a bit. Um, I'm not sure what you missed. Did I freeze on this or did I freeze on the, on the other one, on the other one? Uh, I don't know what you missed. You, you you froze before you got to the one you have in your hand. Okay, what did I? Where was I when I froze? I uh, think you just finished talking about uh, what the commentator said about Zipporah. Is is okay, that right? So Folk? I don't think I said anything too important after that. I think I basically said <laughs> that the commentary series, the commentary series, are really good. Um, as a way of uh, helping to understand what a particular verse means or says. Uh, and so it's really just important that you get a trusted source because anybody can publish a book, right? So you want to make sure that you get a good quality commentator who is going to give you good quality in information. And so, um, but as far as kind of like a two volume set, I, I highly recommend this one. This is a good one. It's a uh, the Bible knowledge commentary. It's not super expensive, all right? When you move up from there, you're going to get a commentary series that essentially has a different commentary, a different book for every book of the Bible. So in this commentary series, there are, there are, uh, there are, there's a book, there is a commentary for every single book of the Bible and every single commentary is written by a different auth author or different scholar who uh, specializes in this particular book, right? And so this happens to be the book of Joshua. Uh, and, you know, this commentary assist book is going to, it's going to break down the Greek, it's going to break down the original, or in this case, the Hebrew, it's going to, it's going to get super duper deep with this. Uh, and so I just really show this to you to suggest to you that there is a different level of depth. 
Um, and so all of these books, as I said, I have an electronic version. Um, and so um, and so you can get all of these commentaries uh, electronically, um, but some of these are expensive. Like, so for example, this commentary series uh, costs about $3,000 for all of them. Um, and so uh, they just they just get expensive. Um, all right, so now, so the last piece I wanna talk about as it relates to Bible tools and commentary- Pastor, I think you had a question. Here. Uh, no, I just wanted to know the uh, name of the last one. It's New International what? It's the New International Commentary on the Old Testament and New International Commentary on the New Testament. It's okay. a it's a it's a series. It's an entire series. Okay, thank you. All right, all right. So one of the things that I want to make sure to say to you is when we talk about um, when we talk about commentaries, they are always somebody else's opinion. And whenever you are dealing with somebody else's opinion, understand that those opinions are influenced, whether we, even if we are not doing it intentionally, they are, they are influenced by our own social location. What I mean by that is they are influenced by who we are. Um, I'll give you, when I, when I took my, um, my Bible interpretation class in, in seminary, uh, my professor on the first day of class, he asked us to do an exercise. He said, what I want you to do, he says, I want you to take out a blank sheet of paper. And on, and, and on that blank sheet of paper, I want you to write everything that you know about yourself, right? So I take out my sheet of paper uh, and I write down things like I'm, I'm male, uh, I, uh, I'm African-American, uh, I grew up uh, in a you know, middle-class house, I'm from the Northeast, uh, United States. I'm American. Um, uh, you know, I'm at the time I was an attorney, so I wrote down I'm, I'm an attorney. Uh, and uh, and then what? And then what he said is, when we all finished doing that exercise, he said, "What I need you to understand is that every single thing you wrote on that paper affects how you interpret the scriptures. There is nothing about you." that you do not bring to the word of God, right? So I'll give you an example. Like, and it's like when, when, when Paul says, uh, women and uh, wives submit to your husbands, wives, wives, typically wives have a response to that, right? It, you know, I, I get a lot of questions about that. When, when we have uh, questions about slaves obey your masters, as African-Americans, that resonates with us in a particular way. Right, um, and so and so the commentators um, always bring themselves to the text, and as and so I always encourage that when you are going to somebody looking for opinion, opinions about the scriptures, look at opinions from a wide variety of people. Right, so when I do my when I do my Bible study, I do Bible studies that include white men, but I also have white women and black women and African Americans and Africans and Asians, because we all have something to say about the word of God, right? And unless we believe that the only people that have ever gotten the theological knowledge are old white men, then we need to go to some sources that are written by people other than old white men, right? Um, and so I wanna give you a couple of those, right? So this, um, and so let me deal, let me talk about the Bible first. And so I'm going to give a shout out to uh, to Carmen Gray who is on the uh, who is on the the, the line today. Uh, I think maybe how many years ago? Maybe I guess this was in 2016. In 2016, for Pastor's Appreciation, she gave me this Bible called the Mosaic Bible. Um, the Mosaic Bible, you remember this, right, Carmen? Yes. So the Mosaic Bible, the Mosaic Bible is interesting in that the, the, the premise of the Mosaic Bible, this is, just the, this is just the biblical text. It's not, it does not manipulate the text at all. The, it is the, it is the um, I think this is the, this is the New Living Translation Bible. Um, but what the Mosaic Bible does is it understands that the world is a mosaic. It's made up of people from different places, made up of people from different cultures, um, different circumstances, and so, and so uh, within this Bible, there are stories and, and paintings and images and 
um, and interpretations of the scripture from people from different parts of the world, right? Uh, and so uh, there are a lot of different things like this, but this is uh, called the Mosaic Bible, right? And so it gives you a uh, it gives you an image of God, right? If the scriptures if the scriptures are true, that says that we are all created in the image and likeness of God, that it's important for us to understand the fullness of the image that God has placed in the world. And the Mosaic Bible is an attempt to do that. To do that, all right. This, this Bible is a Bible that uh, the Christian Education Committee gave me for my 10th past sectoral anniversary. This is called the Africa Study Bible. And the Africa Study Bible um, has, um, has, um, has contributors from the continent of Africa who have written all of the Bible study notes, right? So if you have a study Bible, you know within the Bible, uh, there are going to be different notes about the different passages. This Bible, the, all of the notes were written by African scholars, uh, not African American scholars, by African scholars. Um, and so, uh, and so you get you you get a different perspective about some of the um, some of the passages of Scripture. Frankly, um, and some of them are, in my opinion, a little bit more relevant because. At the end of the day, much of what took place in the Bible took place in Africa and the Middle East, right? And so to the extent that people from that geographic region have some commentary about the passages that we're reading, this can be very, this can be very helpful, all right? Um, this, this commentary is called uh, True to Our Native Land, and you probably recognize that refrain from Lift Every voice and sing, true to our native land is, I think the only, com this is a, a New Testament co commentary. Um, it's not, it doesn't have anything from the Old Testament and it's only the New Testament. I think this is the only commentary that is written by African-American scholars. Uh, Tony Evans would debate that. He would say that Tony, T Tony Evans has his own, uh, has his own uh, commentary uh, and so he always debates that this this commentary bills itself as uh, the first commentary written by uh, black scholars. It was edited by Kane Hope Felder, uh, for who who for a long time uh, was the most prominent New Testament scholar out of Howard University Divinity School. Uh, but Kane Kane Felder was on uh, my ordination council. Um, and, um, and, and he passed uh, in recent years. Uh, but this is a, it's not super deep. It's not gonna, you know, it's not, it's just not super deep in terms of, um, uh, of the volume of information that is in this. But uh, I mean, you see how small it is and it's a commentary on the entire New Testament, but it is, um, Oh, not shake the Bible. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm I'm preaching, so I'm shaking the I'm shaking the uh, the books. I'm sorry about that. Um, so uh, it's not going to give you like super deep uh, in terms of volume, but it's just good. It's a good thing to check in on, right? Um, and so, and there are not just African scholars, but there are great Asian scholars. So one of the things that I'm going to do um, when I when we do, when we get to the Book of Lamentations. Um, a, uh, a, 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 a joint fa a faculty member that I teach with at Fuller Seminary. Uh, his name is Song Chan Ra. He's a Korean scholar, but he has written a phenomenal commentary on lamentations. The name of the, the commentary is Prophetic Lament. Um, and, uh, and it's a great commentary on lamentations. And so I am going to be inviting him to uh, come to our uh, Bible study when we get to the book of Lamentation, uh, and you'll be able to hear from him directly uh, if he's able to come. But, um, but those, are, those are just a few uh, of the resources that I use. There are certainly others out there. Um, there are books that are written on topics, right? So, you know, there's tons of different topics. Like if you, you know, wanted to study the names of God, there are tons of books written on the names of God. If you want to study biblical marriage, there are tons of books on biblical marriage. If you want to talk about uh, giving, there are tons of books on uh, biblical stewardship, uh, parenting. There are parenting books. 
All of those things uh, are great resources that I encourage you to use. Uh, I always, it's always interesting to me, one of, the, one of the common things that I've heard over the 15 years of my pastoring uh, is, pastor, we just want to read the Bible. And I get, I, I get, the, feel, I get the sense of that. Um, and, I, and I want to tell you that if all you do is sit down and you open the Bible and you read it, Yes, the Holy Spirit will give you understanding of the text. That's what this scripture says, that, that the Holy Spirit will do his work, but you will miss a lot. You will, you, will, you will miss out a lot if you don't use the helps that the Lord has provided for us, right? Because the Lord did provide for us his word, but he also raises up scholars and preachers and theologians to help us to understand God's word. And I think it's important that we use all of the resources that the Lord has given us so that we can get a fulsome understanding. Uh, and then as we come together, um, then we share information that we have learned. Uh, and I think it provides an even more robust uh, investigation of, of, of the scriptures. All right, uh, let me open the floor. Thoughts, questions, concerns, issues with any of that. Uh, Janet Henley, Minister Henley is asking, what about the cross-reference Bible? Uh, so uh, Janet, if I'm understanding your question correctly, and you can unmute yourself if, if I'm not answering it the way you want me to answer it, but within your study Bibles, there are usually, um, there are usually marginal commentaries or marginal verses where it will say this verse uh, is related in some way to this verse in another part of the Bible, right? So when we talk about cross-reference Bibles, in many ways, study Bibles include a concordance, right? So um, if you're reading something in John that has a correlating passage in one of the other gospels, um, your study Bible will cross-reference that for you. Uh, Janet, is that what you're getting at? Uh, uh, yes, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a study Bible. I mean, sure, that for cross referencing, yeah, because as you encourage us to deal with the text first before going to other sources, the cross reference helps us to do that, yeah, yeah. And so, let, and let me reinforce that again like, if 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 what you decide to do, and I'm not saying you would do it, but if you if you decided to do it, it's just read the commentary and not read the Bible, you will be messing yourself up. Don't go to somebody else's opinion before you go to the scriptures itself. Um, I think that's, that's, a, that's important because you may, frankly, you may disagree with a commentator and that's, and that's perfectly fine. It's perfectly fine for you to disagree with what somebody else has written about the scripture. Um, you just have to be able to back it up. That's all. All right. Any, any, uh, any, uh, let me look in the chat. I see seven. Those are probably just people telling me to stop waving the Bible or stop. Uh, focus on backwards. Okay. All right. So any any questions about any of the sources that I held up or any other source that you may have heard of or that you might be interested in? Um, one of the things that we can do, and I'm not guaranteeing that this can happen for next week, but I'll, I'll look to see if we have something. But I, I, I want to, now that I've given you some types of resources, I want to make sure that I give you clarity as regards to what are the good resources, right? Because anybody, anybody can post something online. You know, I tell people all the time to be a little bit suspect of just reading random, you know, just Googling things about the Bible and just reading what you find there. Sometimes what you'll find is just, is just garbage, honestly. Um, but there are good, like there are good publishing companies. So for example, basic, anything that you get from Zondervan is going to be pretty good. Um, Zond Zondervan, Z-O-N-D-E-R-V-A-N is a, is a, a publishing house is going to be pretty good. You know, Lifeway is material that we use, um, uh, quite a bit. Um, you're going to get good trusted stuff from there. Um, it, you know, some of this stuff is not going to be really great culturally sensitive stuff, but it's going to be good stuff. Um, Erdman's is a good one. It's E-E-R-D-M-A-N-S. Erdman's is another good publishing house. Judson Press is the press for the Progressive National Baptist Convention. Uh, they generally put out uh, good stuff. Um, uh, and so, uh, 
and so yeah so we'll get we'll get you some we'll get you some good resources um that you can you can start building out your library and the other thing i would do is i would put a plug in for the library at the church like i know that we don't very often go in the library in the church but a lot of the stuff that i've just shown you is in the library right so there are probably eight or nine different atlases there there are multiple versions of the Bible dictionary that are in there. There are Bible encyclopedias in there. There are some commentaries that are there. Um, if you want to check out a book from the library at the church, just come to the library and check it out. Take it with you, but make sure you bring it back. Um, that's always been there. Um, it's just been a very underutilized resource, um, but it's there for you. Um, and so if you want to um, go in there and, and, and check any of that stuff out, feel free to do it. All right. We're going to ask about how to choose. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. If a person is looking for a new Bible. Yeah. So if you're looking for a new Bible, um, you know, it, like, again, it depends on, so safe ones, NIVs are always safe. Like, I feel like the NIV is a great beginner's Bible. Um, it, I mean, it's just a great beginner's Bible. Uh, NIV is good. Um, I think, um, you know, if you want something that's a little bit um, more formal, I think the New King James Version is a good one. That's a little bit more formal. Um, but the NIV is pretty safe. I, I, I will say that much. Um, all right. Any, any other thoughts, questions about any of that? All right. All right. Yes, Robert. Are you unmuting yourself for a reason? Okay. All right. So, so, all right. So then let's transition into the, into the text for today. Um, what I want to do uh, eventually is I want to play uh, the second half of the Bible project video that we watched last week um, that will talk about what we find in um, chapters 19 through 40 in the book of Exodus. But before that, I want to open up the floor for any thoughts, questions, comments about what we read. I know what we read was a lot of, uh, uh, it was a lot of the Mosaic law, right? It's, it's God giving Moses uh, the rules as it relates to how uh, the children of Israel are supposed to be worshiping him. Uh, you see the, the schematics for the tabernacle, uh, you see rules with regard to um, um, the different uh, garments that the priests are supposed to be wearing. Uh, all of those things are to, to do two primary things. They are to separate the children of Israel from the other communities into which they're about to go, right? So we're, we're presumably right now getting ready for the children of Israel to go into the promised land. And what God wants to make sure happens when they go into the promised land is that people are able to see that they are very different from the Canaanites that they're going to be they're living around. So, so there's something there's supposed to be something different about the children of Israel just by the way that they act, that 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 people look at them and say they're different from the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites and the, you know, uh, and the Gergesites and all the other ites that exist in the land of Canaan, right? And so God gives them these rules. He said, you're not supposed to eat what they eat. You're not supposed to dress the way they dress. You're not supposed to worship the way that they worship. Um, and, uh, and, and so in that, and you're not supposed to marry them you're not supposed to worship their gods. You are to be separate from who they are. That is the purpose for all of the rules uh, that you're going to begin reading as you go through the end of Exodus into Leviticus. Um, that, that's the reason for all of it. And it, it formalizes the worship uh, of the people of God uh, to Yahweh. All right. Any thoughts, questions about what you read in the end of Exodus? Mm -hmm. Pastor, I just have one question. Yes. Good evening. Hello. Um, in Exodus 30, verse 11 through 15, there's um there's talk about atonement money. And I was just wondering, is that the same as giving tight offerings? Right, right. So 
It, it is. And so the, 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 the idea, it's not necessarily the tithe yet, right? It's not, it's not a specific amount, right? Because even here uh, and in the book of Exodus, we have seen God say, bring what is, the Lord lays on your heart, right? As, they're, bring, as yeah. they're bringing offerings for the building of the tabernacle, he says, as you are led, you know, bring these different things. But what we see even as early as Exodus and even beyond Exodus, right? This is the story of Cain and Abel, is that worship includes bringing something to the Lord as a sign and demonstration of our commitment and trust in him, right? At mm -hmm. one point, um, I think God, the Bible says explicitly, Explicitly in, in Exodus, it says, do not come empty handed. Like the Lord says it very explicitly, do not come to worship empty handed, right? Mm -hmm. Bring something uh, mm -hmm. to give as an offering and as a sacrifice. Uh, and that's what we're talking about here in this Exodus 30 passage. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. You're welcome. Margaret? Oh, uh, Oh, uh, let me get the Margaret had her hand up. So I'm going I'm to come to you in order, okay, uh, Carmen? Put your hand up, uh, Carmen. Mar Margaret. <laughs> uh, good evening, Pastor. How are you? I'm well, how are you? I'm good. So I'm, 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 my question is about Aaron um, in Exodus chapter 32, verses 1 to 29. And my question was, why would Aaron allow himself to be persuaded to make any kind of idol of God when he knew of the true God? Yeah, right? that's my and, question and the, too. And the, that's and my the, question and the too. The funny thing, right? The funny thing is when when Moses confronts him, he says, "Yeah, they gave me they gave me their gold, and I just threw it into the water, and a calf just came out of the water, right?" Nice, so, nice. so he knew he knew he was wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, and so and so that's a, a really good question, right? But yes. I think the other question that's really great in that is is why did the people right? You're going to see in the video that I'm going to show you that like the, the glory cloud that that is uh, with Moses uh, on Mount Sinai, the people at the base of the mountain can see that, right? They can see God right there. And yet and still they're like, OK, so uh, we want you to build a, a calf that we can worship. And they call the calf. The God that delivered them from Egypt, right? And okay. so, and so God is furious, right? He's furious at the people. Mm -hmm. He's furious at Aaron. He says to Moses on Sinai, He says, "Stay here and let me go and destroy mm -hmm. all of those people, and I'll mm -hmm. make you a mighty nation," right? Mm -hmm. uh, and so, um, and so, yeah, I, you know, you ask a good question, but I guess the answer to that is, why do any of us sin, right? <laughs> why, why, why do any of us? Why do any of us do stuff well, we know that we know that the Lord doesn't want us to do, right? Um, uh, you know, some of us have built our own calves in our life. Uh, and we look back and we ask ourselves the question, why, why did I, you know, why did I do that? Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, the question is a good question. Um, I, and I don't know the answer to that you don't have to ask Aaron when you see him. Aaron, what, what, what's up? Like, how, 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 did, how did you let that happen? <laughs> Okay, thanks, Pastor. You're welcome. Linda. Uh, yes, thank you, Pastor. Yes. Um, so this is a this is a manna question. Yes. Um, so in uh Exodus 16, um it, the Lord sends manna. And um when we get to 32 um, through 34, uh, Moses said, the Lord commands that an omer of manna be kept for the generations um, and it's to be put with the tablets, right? Right. And then when we get over to um, yesterday's reading, so we're in Exodus 40, um, when the tabernacle's completed and it speaks of place the Ark of the Covenant of the place in the, the Ark of the Covenant law in it and shield the Ark with the curtain. Does it, is there any place that it ever speaks again about manna being put in the Ark with, with the tablets? Yeah, so the answer to that question is, I don't know if, it, if the Bible speaks to it being put in there again, but what, what, what we would believe is that if anyone was to find the Ark of the Covenant today, that inside the Ark of the Covenant would be the Ten Commandments, and there would be that jar of manna would be in there, right? Um, and, and because the jar of manna that was put inside the Ark of the Covenant 
is really just symbolic of the Lord's provision for his people. Like that's why, that's why it was put in there. Um, and so I'm not sure, honestly, if the Bible speaks to it again, but we would believe that we would find that in the ark today if we were to find it somewhere. Okay, I, this is another one of those passages that I, having read the Bible a bunch of times, don't remember <laughs> seeing about putting manna in with the tablets. So yeah, um, yeah, 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 it's, it's in there. Yeah, okay, thank you. All right, you're welcome. Robert and then Carmen, Robert. All right, Carmen, you can go, Carmen. Um, I'm talking about, I'm in numbers. So the, okay. uh, when I was reading it, the dedication that the 12 tribe uh, Judea brought and Manasseh's name, and all of a sudden I said Manasseh, but Manasseh was Joseph, Manasseh and Ephraim was Joseph's son. But, you know, all the time I was, I never thought about that, and it, it just kind of struck me. Yeah, yeah. If you remember, if you remember, at the end of Genesis, Jacob adopts Joseph's son, right? Blessings. Yeah, he he adopts them, and so okay. um, and so they become they actually receive part of the inheritance, right? So mm -hmm. when we get ready to watch, see Joshua, and we see. Um, the land of Israel divided up among the sons, you're going to see that Manasseh uh, actually gets an inheritance as part of the 12 tribes, right? Even though he wasn't one of Jacob's sons, he's actually, as you said, um, Jacob's grandson. Um, all right. I know, I, I mean, as I said, it just, uh, all the time I was reading it, I didn't think about it. But for yeah. some reason, when his name came up, all of a sudden, well, he's not a son, you know, and then it it it, it came to me. Yeah, About but you are wait. We we're not in numbers yet, Carmen. You you like two two books ahead of us. We we still back in Exodus. All right, <laughs> uh, so Margaret. That's what I have. We have uh, readings in numbers. Thank you, thank you, Pastor. Again, I meant to ask this question when I asked the first one, um, and I I'm and this is the first time me seeing this too, and I wonder. Why did Joshua stay at the tent? This is an um, Exodus, I'm sorry, Exodus chapter 32 again, verses 30. I, okay, yeah, okay. And actually it's verse 33. Okay. So, Matthew. so verse on, 11, verse, I'm sorry, verse 11. All right, Exodus. I'll read it. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, it says the Lord would the Lord would spoke uh, the Lord would speak to Moses face to face, as one speaking to a friend. Then Moses would return to the camp, but his young ass assistant or aide Joshua, son of Nun, did not leave the tent. Why? Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that we're going to see I, when you're asking me why I'm not, I'm not sure I can give you a specific okay. answer to that. Okay. But one of the things that we know about Joshua is that we know that Joshua um, is, is the right hand person of, of, of Moses. Well, he was, he was, he's the successor, right? He's the administrative right. successor of Moses. When Moses dies, Joshua is going to take over from him. Right. And so right. I think one of the things that we see uh, is we see succession planning. Um, and we okay. see the Lord, you know, exposing Joshua to different things, right? Okay. Because, okay. because Joshua, once Moses turns the reins over to Joshua, Joshua is going to need to know how to Thanks. meet with the Lord. Yeah, He's yeah, going to yeah. need to know what it is for the leader of Israel to receive instruction from the Lord. And so I think Joshua is kind of hanging around in some pretty critical moments okay. in order to to almost get his training, okay. his leadership training. Okay, uh, that makes sense. when he's going to be taking over. That makes uh, sense. That makes sense. Thank you. All right. Uh, John Abaka? Yes, Pastor. Just an observation. Yes. I see that all the leaders were supposed to bring their gifts. It looks like everybody brought the same thing. That looks so strange to me. You know. So, so tell me where you see that, because I, I think... I think people brought what 
So, you know, God, God gives them an inventory, right? He says, he says, in order to build the tabernacle, for example, he says, you're going to need to build this curtain. It's going to have to have goat hair. It's going to have to have uh, red dye leather. It's going to need to, you know, have gold for the rings and brass and silver. And he says, and he just basically almost is almost like he gives a list and he says, bring what you bring, what you have, what you, what you can contribute. So yeah. I don't know that everybody brings the same thing, but I do believe that people all bring things from the same list, right? Yeah, because, because these are the, the leaders. Yes, Pastor. These are the leaders who are bringing it every day, like first day, second day. And when you look at it, it looks like everybody was bringing like the same thing. He's so talking about number seven, I think. And number yes. seven. Um, no, he's, all, he's talking about the yeah, yeah, talking about dedication. Yeah. yeah. Well, okay. From the 12 tribes. Right. Yes. Yeah, it looks so strange. I'm like, was, uh, what did I get on the same list? It looks like they all brought the same thing. Okay. Okay, so tell me about that. Tell me about that being, um, tell me yeah. your feelings. About, I was, about when that. I was reading, I was thinking that did they all go to the same person to, to like, for example, they have um, a gold dish which was weighing 10 shekels filled with the incense, and everybody had the same amount of weight every, uh, for the next day, the next day. It's like, I was wondering if they were all went to one person together or did hmm. they have a list or something like that? I was just wondering. They had the I don't thing. know. Let me, let, me, <laughs> let me see if I can, let me see if I can look at the comments like here and that. tell you what it says real quick about this. Okay. Amen. Uh, that's number, so that's number seven. Yes. Yeah. Number seven, yes. Let me see if it says anything about that. Okay. All right, so for number seven. All right, so it says the offering of the leaders. Yeah. Uh, it says each of the 12 tribal leaders brought offerings for the dedication of the altar. The word for leader, and it gives me the Hebrew word, meaning elevated one. The first to bring his gift uh, was Nashon, leader of Judah. His contribution, in addition to the carts, uh, and the oxen contained a silver plate, 130 shekels weighing. Um, it's something, let me see, 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 all the remaining tribal representation of 12 leaders. Um, yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't say, it doesn't say anything about there being significance around um, what the, you know, the people bringing the same thing. Um, yeah, so I don't I don't know. I would need to I would need to look at that more. But I think it's an observation. But John, I think it's an observation to make. Um, I think the question is, so what does does it mean anything? And if so, what is that? Yeah. Yeah, just an observation. Yes, sir. Yeah, yep. No, I think it's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. Robert, um, I see your hand. Sorry, sorry. I don't know. Oh, yeah. Go ahead. I wanna, I wanna say that that struck me as well. And I'm wondering when my thought is that it was a way of having all the leaders of each of the tribes come and acknowledge their reverence or whatever it is to the Lord. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I, I was wondering why it was the same thing as well, but, but mm -hmm. I, I was thinking that it's, it's spelled out so that we can see that each of the tribes, rather than saying, okay, all 12 of the tribes, but, Blah 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 yeah. blah blah. Yeah, yeah, they yeah. name them one by one. They're specific yeah. about it because yeah. you know, just for for you to see that the families were all represented, all the leaders, yeah. all the tribes were represented rather than yeah. the families. Yeah, so and that's so just my I, I absolutely. So I absolutely agree with you um, that the reason why it's spelled out is because there want you want to be there's some clarity involved in each of the each of the tribe's commitment. What you're gonna see when we go through the book of Numbers in particular is that, is that all of the tribes are treated, um, are treated equally in terms of the amount of tension, attention and amount of detail that is given to them, right? They are, they are treated as separate nations um, that have their own leadership, um, and, and so at this time, I think the Bible is pretty clear about that. As they come together, right, there's going to stop being the tri 12 tribes and they're going to just be Israel and Judah, right? 
Uh, and then later, they're just going to really be Israel. But for now, I think the Bible gives a lot of attention to the individuality uh, of each of the tribe. And I think the, as you would say, the, um, um, the, the commitment of each of the tribes to uh, being faithful to what the Lord has called them to, I think, is one of the reasons why you do see uh, in, this, in, this, um, in, in this passage kind of the detail there. All right, Robert, I, I see you have a hand, your hand has been up for a minute. All right, do you actually have a question? And if so, go ahead and unmute yourself and, and ask your question. All right, I think maybe, the, okay, I think maybe his hand is just up. Linda? Uh, just another observation. Um, thought it was interesting that the, the first tribe to bring the offering the first day was, was Judah, um, mm -hmm. just knowing the significance that the tribe of Judah has as we go mm -hmm. forward in the Bible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think that's good. All right, so let me do this. Let me go ahead and show this video and then I'll open the floor back up uh, for any questions that may come from this. But this is, again, the Bible Project talking about Exodus 19 through 40. So we watched the first half last week. This is six minutes uh, and it will be the second half. And I think it sums up the, the book of Exodus really well. So let me go ahead and, and share this. Uh, I don't want this. This is not what I want. This is. Can you also can you all still see me? Okay, my my Zoom was acting up for a second, so let me go ahead and, and share this again. Um, uh, all right, come on. All right, so this this picture uh, is actually the picture from the top of Mount Sinai. Right, so when we uh, when we read about uh, Moses being uh, with the Lord at the top of the mountain, uh, this gives you a sense of what he might have seen. I mean, but beyond obviously the um, beyond beyond the the the, uh, the glory cloud itself, um, you this is what he might this is what he might have seen up there. All right. All right, we got we got uh, Charlton Heston. Uh, now, can you all hear me? I want to make sure before I play this. You, you all... yes. Yes. yes, yes, yes. Oh, what happened? All right, I I stopped. Right, it's it stopped. From my life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I feel like I'm having some internet stuff. So did you guys see the Mount Sinai picture that I showed or did yes. you? Yeah. All right. All right. I'm going to I'm going to right, I'm going to pull up the the video and I need somebody to tell me if you are uh if you're seeing it, okay? So I can um I'll go ahead and start it. All right. Are you are you guys seeing this? Yes. Yes. All right. I'm going to go ahead and and start it. Okay. Good. The Book of Exodus. In the first video, we explored chapters 1 through 18, which tell the foundational story of how God rescued the enslaved Israelites by confronting and defeating Pharaoh, while offering a way of escape through the blood of the Passover lamb. God then delivered his people by bringing them through the waters of the sea and then into the wilderness, where, surprisingly, they grumbled and complained. 
Now, the second half of the book of Exodus opens as Moses leads Israel to the foot of Mount Sinai, where God invites the nation of Israel to enter into a covenant relationship. And here we reach another key moment in the biblical storyline, because this is picking up and developing God's promise to Abraham. So remember, from the book of Genesis, God promised that through Abraham's family, somehow he would restore his blessing to all of the nations. And here we find out more. God says that if Israel obeys the terms of the covenant. They will be so shaped by God's laws and teaching and justice that they will become a kingdom of priests, which means that they will become God's representatives and show all of the other nations what God is truly like. Now the people of Israel eagerly accept the offer, and so God's presence appears right on the top of Mount Sinai in the form of cloud and lightning and thunder. And Moses goes up as their representative, and God opens with the basic terms of the covenant, the famous Ten Commandments. These are like the basic terms of the agreement, how the Israelites and God are going to relate to each other. And then after this come another collection of commands which fill out the first ten in more detail. There are laws about Israel's worship, about social justice, how they are to live together, all shaping Israel into a nation of justice and generosity that's different from the other nations. So Moses writes down all of these laws and he brings them down to the people who again eagerly agree to enter into this covenant with God. And once they do so, God takes the relationship forward another step. He tells Moses that he wants his holy and divine and good presence to come and dwell right in the midst of Israel, which develops another aspect of God's covenant promises. So remember, after humanity's rebellion in the garden, it was access to God's presence that was lost. But now it's through the family of Abraham that God's presence is becoming once again accessible through this covenant relationship, and first with Israel, and then somehow one day to all nations. So what follows are seven chapters of detailed architectural blueprints about this sacred tent called the tabernacle. There's an outer courtyard with an altar, and then in the center there's a tent that has an outer room and then an inner room. And then inside the inner room, which is called the most holy space, is a golden box called the Ark of the Covenant. And there's angelic creatures over the top of it. It's the hot spot of God's presence. Now there's lots of detail in these chapters, and it's important to know that every piece has some kind of symbolic value. All of the flowers, the angels, the gold and the jewels, it all echoes back to the Garden of Eden, the place where God and humans live together in intimacy. And so the tabernacle is like a portable Eden, so to speak. It's the place where God and Israel can live together in peace, at least in theory, because right here something goes really, really wrong. Israel breaks the covenant. As Moses is up on the mountain receiving the blueprints for the tabernacle, down below at the camp, the Israelites, they're losing patience. And so they ask Moses' brother Aaron to make for them a golden calf idol so they can worship it as the God who saved them out of slavery in Egypt. Now God's presence, it's right there on top of the mountain. They can see it. But here they are below, breaking the first two commands of the covenant they just agreed to. No other gods and no idols. Now what follows is really important. God knows what's happening down below. And so he first invites Moses into his own anger and pain. And he tells Moses what he wants to do, just to wipe Israel out. But Moses intercedes by appealing to God's character. He says, first of all, destroying Israel would be going back on your covenant promises to Abraham. And then Moses appeals to God's reputation among the nations. What would they think if they see you destroying your own people? And so God accepts Moses' intercession and he relents. And while he does bring his judgment on those who instigated the idolatry, he forgives the nation as a whole and promises to renew his covenant. And it's right here at this point in the story that God, for the first time, describes his own character to Moses. He says, the Lord is merciful, he's gracious, he's slow to anger, abounding in covenant faithfulness. He forgives sin, but he will not leave the wicked unpunished. So we have this tension. God is full of mercy, but also he must deal with evil if he claims to be good. And above all, God is faithful to his promises, even though it means, he knows, he's committing himself to a people who are utterly faithless.
And so after renewing the covenant with Israel, God commissions Moses to go ahead and build the tabernacle. And once again, we get five long chapters describing in detail the construction of the tabernacle. And it all comes together in the final chapter where the tabernacle's finished. God's glorious divine presence comes and hovers over the tent and our hopes are high. And so Moses, he goes right up to enter into the tent and he can't. He actually can't go in and that's how the book ends. It's really surprising, but not really if you think about it. You can see now how much Israel's sin has damaged the relationship with God in more ways than we realized. So the book opened, remember, with Pharaoh's evil threatening Israel and threatening God's covenant promise. But now as the book ends, Israel has become its own worst enemy. It's their sin that's threatening the future of the covenant. And so the question as the book closes is how is God going to reconcile this conflict between his holiness and his goodness and his presence with the sinful corruption of his own covenant people? The solution to that problem is what the next book is about, but for now, that's the book of Exodus. All right, great. I always just feel like the Bible Project does such a great job um, in their in their work, and so I'm hopeful that that has provided uh, some general overview of of the Book of Exodus. Um, let, let me add, open the floor uh, kind of one more time and find out if there's any uh, other thoughts or any questions or anything uh, that comes out of Exodus. Brenda. You, Brenda, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay. Chapter 23, verse, what is that? Verse 9 says, Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the seven elders, they saw the God of Israel. It says that they actually saw God. Mm hmm. Yeah, so we, I think we alluded to this last week. So what the Lord what the Lord says to the children of Israel is not that they can't see him, but they that they wouldn't see him face to face, right? That's something that they said that he said he says at some point, right? And so we do know uh, that the children of Israel saw the glory of God, right? Even at the tabernacle, right? At the conclusion of Exodus, we know that the glory of the Lord rested on the, 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 the cloud rested on the tabernacle, right? And when the cloud was resting, you know, that's when the people knew to stay, right? But, um, but the children of Israel saw, saw the Lord, but just didn't see him kind of face to face. Um, and so, yeah, and so there, I don't think there's a conflict there. If that's what your question is, that you're surprised that they saw him. Um, I, I remember the discussion from last week. Yeah. Uh, um, so it's just that they didn't, they saw him, but they didn't see him face to face. Defense. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, it, it appears at least that there is some distinction, right? that there's some distinction between seeing the glory, right, of God, right? Because that's what, that you, th there seems to be some sort of distinction that people can somehow see the presence of the Lord and, and still be able to be restricted from seeing what no one can see without dying and or, you know what no one can see and live and i'm not exactly sure what that distinction is but we know that people have people see the lord hmm. i mean i can I'm, I'm happy to i'm happy to because this is a question that came up last week as well i'm happy give me another give me a week let me kind of do some digging on it and see if i can provide it some better clarity on that um because i know that that's not really uh maybe a, a robust answer for you but let me let me see what i can the distinction between seeing god and his glory would the egyptians have seen his glory too as they were being separated from them before they went through the sea i mean with the cloud me you say that because you see tell me because why the, you, I'm, yeah. I'm just thinking in terms of the cloud that separated them and and wouldn't we consider that also God's yeah. presence. I mean, even even as I say that, right? Even as I said that about the cloud, I'm not even sure that the cloud is the pre is the 
is is seeing the Lord, right? Because we know that the, the Lord's presence was at the mercy seat. That's where it was. It was inside the Holy of Holies, right? And so the cloud that rested on top of the tabernacle, um, I, I've got some questions as to whether or not that's the actual presence of the Lord or whether it's just the a cloud as um, as a... a um, as a kind of almost like a do not disturb sign, right? You know, you put a sign on the door that says that the Lord is in his in, in his temple. Um, so let me let me do some back, let me do some further kind of uh, investigation of that whole thing, and I'll have a better answer for you when we come back together. Okay. All right. Margaret. I think Pam was before me. Okay, Pamela. I had a comment. Um, I thought Moses was very bold to go before the Lord and speak on behalf of the Israelites and to, yeah. remind, to remind God of his promise. Mm -hmm. He kind of reminded me of Abraham mm -hmm. speaking to the Lord saying, you know, yeah. if there are 50 righteous people. Yeah. Um, and he, he even said, and you can even wipe my name out. Mm -hmm. of the book yeah. so I just you know it's a comment I thought he was very bold yeah. very great to do that yeah yeah I think I think you see I think so yeah I think you see a great example of leadership there right I mean uh, Moses has clearly adopted the mantle of representing the people uh, and he does it in a pretty selfless way I mean I think Moses all throughout the book of Exodus exercises a level of patience and a level of wisdom a level of discernment as it relates to how he leads the people that is really remarkable, right? You, you have Moses who, you know, risks his life to go down before Pharaoh to have people, to have the children of Israel released. Uh, and the same people that he uh, worked to liberate uh, start grumbling and complaining, blaming him for being hungry. Uh, and, and, and these are the same people uh, that, he, that got, he pleads with God to spare them. Uh, and he says, do it for your own names. He says, even if you don't do it for them, do it for your own namesake. What will people say about you? Right. Like, what will the Canaanites say about you if you destroy these people? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, uh, and that's exactly like you said, what Abraham does. Abraham says to the Lord, far be it from you to judge mm -hmm. the wicked and the righteous alike. Right. And so uh, and I think and I would say that that's not something just for Moses and Abraham, but even in your own private prayer, um, you know, there, you can use the Lord's own words, right? Yeah. He, he is not offended That's what he wants uh, to do. if you say to him, God, you said that if I brought my tithes and offerings into the sore house, that you would do this. You, you said that you would supply all of my needs according to your riches and glory, right? You said that if I was faithful, that you would these things. Um, I don't think the Lord is offended by that at all. Um, I would agree with you, Pamela, that I think there's a certain level of boldness that uh, is required to do that. But then again, the writer of Hebrews says that we can enter boldly into the presence of the Lord through the veil, which is the flesh of Christ, right? So one of the great blessings of being um, sons and daughters of God and joint heirs with Christ is that we can go to God as if we're going to our own parents, right? That we have, there's a certain standing that we have before the Lord as his children that allows us to be bold uh, in our um, in our defense and in our um, uh, prayer. So, uh, so I think he, he models that for us. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Pastor. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Margaret. Okay, this is, um, you know me with the why. Um, this is the dedication of the priests. Um, yeah. I was just concerned about, and, and, and when you read these things, you read them over and over, and then you, and then, then you have a question, and why was this, why was that? So yeah. I wanted to know why did um, God have Aaron's son put blood on Aaron's earlobe? Is there a particular? Yeah, I knew I knew you were going to ask me about that, and yeah. I meant to. I knew somebody was going to ask me about that, and I meant to look it up because uh, I knew the answer to that at one point. And I, <laughs> it's not just his earlobe, but it's, it's yeah. I think it's his toe as well. It is not just. It is like his right earlobe. Like it's very specific. Uh, and at one point, I knew the answer to that, but I know I know I can give you where what the, what is the passage? What's the passage? Okay. Have the scripture reference. 
Yeah. I know I can give you the answer to that right now. I know that will be in this commentary. So if you give me the scripture, you know, I'll tell you what it says. I, I would say, um, well, it's a lot, but um, well, well, I, I was going to start, start um, chapter uh, 29, Exodus okay. chapter 29. I would say starting at um, verse 10. All right. Let me see here. Were they doing the slurring and all that? And all right, yeah, here you go. So it's um, Exodus 29, 15 to 21. This is okay. what it says. It says, yeah. the second sacrifice that one, uh, one of the two rams was to be burnt a burnt offering. Unlike sacrifices that were consumed by the worshiper yeah. and the priest, the burnt offering was to be entirely consumed on the altar. The ram's blood was sprinkled on all sides of the altar and the ram was to be cut into pieces. The third animal was to be sacrificed. What uh, to be sacrificed was the other ram. Its blood was placed on the right ears, right thumbs, and right big toe of Aaron and his sons, right. signifying that they were cleansed and dedicated to the to God. Blood on the ear may have symbolized dedication to the hearing of God's word. Okay. Blood on the thumb would have pictured holiness in doing God's work. And blood on the toe may have yeah. spoken to walking carefully in the service of God. The okay. rest of the blood of the sec second ram was sprinkled on the altar and on, on the priest and on their garments with the anointing oil. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That helps you? That yeah. e ear, yeah. our ears, the hearing, it's, thumb yeah. is the doing, toe and, and the, is walking. It's the walking, the yeah. Pastor, Amen. what Thank did you just read from? I read that commentary from the... The, the commentary I showed you, the Bible knowledge commentary. Okay, thank oh, you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Pastor. Yep. Um, uh, Artist Juanita. Uh, yes, Pastor. You know, then we were talking about the cloud, and in uh, Exodus uh, fourteen nineteen, it says, "Then the angel of the Lord, who had been traveling in front of the Israel of Israel's army." withdrew and went behind them yeah the cloud also moved from in front and stood between them so it's yeah in, yeah the yeah so the Lord. right right so so uh so that was when remember they're going through the red sea i think that's when that was right and so the cloud the cloud went to the rear of israel so that they're pursuing Egyptians would not be able to see what the children of Israel were doing, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, so I think, but I guess the question is the cloud is, I don't, I don't actually, I'm not sure that the cloud is the actual uh, well, it says, presence it's, it's, of the glory the of the Lord, the like, yeah. It says it's the angel of the Lord. Right. Yeah. Right, not the Lord, you know, not right, 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 right. But doesn't it say that the angel and the cloud separately, brother? Yeah, they're, they are separate. They are separate, right? Because at one point the angel, at one point the angel, I'm trying to remember. At one point the angel was in the back. At one point the yeah. angel was in the front. At one point the cloud is in the front. Angel. So they're two separate things, and the angel is is really an a, the angel, right? right? So the angel is not a. It's not the theophany. It's it's Gabriel or one of the other angels. Um, and so, um, uh, and so those are, those are, those are two separate things. I mean, that's your point that they're separate. So Pastor, I have a question. Yes. So in Exodus 31, um, when the Lord said to Moses, as he had set aside, um, these people, um, and I guess I'm, my question about this is that he talks about, he's filled them with the spirit of God, with wisdom and understanding. And I guess yeah. I'm wondering if that's like spiritual gifts. It's the Holy Spirit. It's exactly what it is, right? So, so we know we know that in the Old Testament that the Holy Spirit did come upon people to it filled people in order to do particular work, right? So you're going to see the same thing happen when David is built, when Solomon is building the temple. When right. Solomon is building the temple, it's going to say that there were artisans that were filled with the Holy Spirit in order to do the work of building. But then once the building and once the work is done, the Holy Spirit then retreats 
um, uh, back to the father. So, so that's exactly what this is. That's exactly what it is. All right. Any anything else for the for the evening? All right. So we are so we are in numbers. Uh, today was the today was the first day. I'm going to come to you, Mary, before I close in prayer. Um, we we did we are in numbers. So we're going to be in numbers in Leviticus. You're going to see they're overlapping a little bit. Uh, and so this is where I said last week uh, is going to require some discipline, right? We got a little bit of taste of that at the end of Exodus as you're reading the same things as it relates. It's like, sometimes I feel like the Bible, I'm like, I want to say, you could have, you know, we really have, we, we really could have said this one time, but, but instead you're going to see, uh, you're going to see the same, literally the same words um, multiple times. Uh, you're going to read a bunch of names that are going to seem insignificant, um, you're going to read a lot of individual little laws that you're going to read a uh, given multiple times, but I encourage you to stay the course. Um, and, uh, and we will make it, we will make it through together. All right. But, but, I, but even as I say that in all seriousness, I would encourage you, um, uh, maybe this is a time to be, um, extra prayerful, not just about the di diligence in doing the reading and making it through the reading, but prayerful that the Lord would be um, especially kind as it relates to um, uh, uh, showing us some things in the text that may seem like they're insignificant, but really will prove to be pretty important. There are some within some of these um, these genealogies and census na uh, names, there are some pretty significant names that are hidden within those. Um, and so let's maybe uh, see if we can see something that we haven't seen. I'm believing that the Lord will be faithful in that regard. All right, Mary. Yeah. Um, yes, I was uh, trying to, uh, Exodus uh, chapter 24, verse 16 and 17. I don't know if that would help about the glory of the Lord and the clouds. I don't know if you will read it from the uh, interpretations and see if that helps answers our concern about how God's presence and the glory. It reads, uh, verse 24, 16, and 17. And the glory of the Lord abode upon Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered, covered it six days. And the seventh day he called unto Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was the devouring fire on the top of the mount in the eyes of the children of Israel. Yeah, so I think that's helpful in some regards, right? Because it does, it does seem at least to draw some distinction between the cloud and the actual glory, right? Because it says, now the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai and the cloud covered it six days, right? So it, so, so it seems as if the cloud is different than the glory of the Lord, which is what I was trying to to kind of say before, which makes sense, right? Because the glory of the Lord rests on top of the mercy seat on top of the Ark of the Covenant, while the cloud rests on the top of the tabernacle itself, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so, and so, yeah, so I think that, I think that's helpful um, as an example of that. Um, I will continue, I will go back and, and, and look more, but I do think that that passage you mentioned is helpful. So thank you for that. Thank you for that. Uh, Janet, I think you were, um, Take, I think I saw you take your mute off, Minister. Yeah. Yeah, sure. I was getting ready to type it in. But when we're talking about these genealogies and all of the things that are so difficult, are they not also helpful in our arguing the authenticity of scripture that these people are real people that can be <laughs> and found outside of um, outside of the uh, outside of scripture? It yeah. Yeah, no, I think that I think that's a good point, right? So, um, right, I think all of that is I think all of that is is uh, is good. So, if you're asking me, is it helpful? Yes, the answer is helpful um, to the extent that we are able to cross match what we find in the scripture against what we find in other sources, or um, all all of that stuff is very is all all of that's very helpful, and it will all be helpful helpful as well, even as we're progressing towards the New Testament, right? Because um, the family lineage of these people um, 
is important as we relate to uh, what we're going to find in the uh, later on with the priesthood and then ultimately what we're going to find um, in some of these um, uh, genealogies of Christ himself. You have you're still off mute. You have you have follow up. Oh, no, I'm just I'm just simply just highlighting it, its value as we struggle yeah. through it. Just know yeah. that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In yeah, no, an apologetic it. setting, we might have to draw from it. That's yeah, all. yeah. No, that's helpful. That's good. That's good. All right. Well, as always, I am I am grateful uh, for uh, the time we've spent. Look, Minister Henley, since you took yourself off the mute, why don't you go ahead and pray us out? Amen. So, so Father, as we're reading your scriptures and we're thinking about how you showed yourself to these people, we do wonder uh, what it would have been like to, to be there and to, to see you and experience you in the way that they did. But we know uh, that we have the better uh, revelation, the fuller one in Jesus. And, and so we're grateful as we sit here as your people uh, under the umbrella of this name, Clifton Park, that we're on a journey together as they were. I think you just muted yourself. Janet, I think you muted yourself. All right, maybe not. So me, let, no, no. Oh. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so Father, we're just grateful uh, for your word and for the discoveries that we're making, the questions that we have. It, it just speaks to how you're just making us hungry for you and allowing us to see perhaps, God, what we've not seen before. And so have your way as we yield and we surrender uh, and as we entrust our lives to you. May we prove faithful. <laughs> uh, and we ask it. Uh, we thank you for Pastor lifting him up. Uh, for the work that he does on behalf of, of you and on behalf of, of us. And so we do bow down and do so through the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, everybody have a great rest of the night, Amen. okay? God Take bless. Care. Good night. All right. Bye-bye. Good, Good, Good night. Good night. Good night. Bye.